Renee Choi is going to talk to us about stem cell transplantation in dry AMD. Give him a second to get his computer all fired up here. There you go. Thank you. All right. Hello, everybody. So I'm Renee Choi. I just want to thank, thank Zach again for reminding me that I'm a huge geek as well. <laughs> I knew that he thought that of me as I entered residency, because one of the first questions he asked me was, why are your glasses so thick? <laughs> when I was saying that, uh, we're really going to miss you, Zach. Um, all right, so let's get started. Today, I'd like to cover a topic that I find personally to be very interesting. You know, the last number of years I've been to Arvo. And that's this topic of stem cells uh, and their involvement in regenerating the retina. So to begin this journey, we really have to define what exactly stem cells are. Stem cells are a group of cells right, that are not committed toward any specific cell fate. They have the limitless potential to regenerate, proliferate, self-renew, and they can become any cell type in the body. Now, aside from embryonic stem cells, there are also what are known as adult stem cells. These are endogenous stem cells that are in our body throughout our lives that regenerate or replace lost tissue from everyday wear and tear. Some of these include bone marrow stem cells, intestinal stem cells, corneal stem cells, which everybody here is particularly um, uh, familiar with, uh, as well as even neural stem cells in the brain. However, to date, there are no identified retinal stem cells in the human eye. And, that, and that's particularly disappointing because there are a number of diseases that affect the retina and impair vision by reducing the elements here that are responsible for processing vision. Many of these include retinitis pigmentosa, cone rod dystrophies, age-related macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, as well as glaucoma. Now, to emphasize the gravity of these diseases, I'd like to demonstrate to you how somebody who's afflicted with retinitis pigment pigmentosa, how this disease manifests visually in this patient. So here's a beautiful picture of uh, Teton National Park. For all of us who are not afflicted with this disease, we have no problem seeing this image in its entirety. But over time, somebody with retinitis pigmentosa slowly loses their peripheral vision until they reach irreversible blindness, okay? So I thought to myself, how amazing would it be if, just like the cornea, we we're able to regenerate lost photoreceptors, any other cell type you're interested in, in the retina, just like in the cornea when the epithelial cells, you know, are abraded, those new corneal stem cells grow in and replace that tissue. So the first question I asked when I did my literature search was to determine is there any evidence of regeneration that takes, pl takes place in the retina, regardless of the species. To begin this journey, we first have to go into the history of stem cell regeneration. 1744, Abraham Trembley, he was a Swiss naturalist, he was the first to observe that when you surgically resect a limb from a hydra, it's able to regenerate that limb almost as if no intervention ever took place. A few years later, in 1781, Charles Binet, who's actually a cousin of Abraham Tremblay, uh, realized that when he surgically resected the eye the, in a newt, a newt was able to regenerate the lens as well as parts of the retina as well. Now, this discovery set essentially um, led to the in the next two centuries all the all the uh, further investigations that took place in retinal regeneration. So let's get to the core. What are the source of newly generated cells in the retina? Well, it depends on two things. It depends on the species, and also depends on where you're looking in the retina. Now, in the very center of the retina, in amphibians, the putative stem cells are thought to be the retinal pigmented epithelial cells. In the fish, it's thought to be the molar glial cells. However, in both species, in the peripheral retina, there's an area known as the ciliar marginosome actually gives rise to new retinal progenitors throughout the life of the animal. And let's talk about that a little bit more. So here's the ciliary marginal zone. It lies in between the ciliary epithelium and the neural retina. And throughout the life of the animal, it gives rise to new retinal progenitors and cells of all type that are specific to the retina. 
Now what's remarkable about the CMZ is that there's this feedback loop. When you damage the retina in amphibians and fish, the CMZ is able to, to uh, pick up on that and actually increase <coughs> proliferation in the CMZ. But what's even more remarkable is that if you ablate a specific cell type, if you ablate, for instance, amacrine cells, the CMZ picks up on that and actually generates a higher proportion of amacrine cells compared to the other cell types. Now, what about in mammals, you know, including humans? Do we have a CMZ? Unfortunately, we don't. Now, as I alluded to earlier, the source of newly generated cells in the central retina are thought to be the retinal pigmented epithelial cells in amphibians. Let's just cover, touch a, a little bit about um, what retinal pigmented epithelial cells are responsible for. It mainly serves as a, ha, has a supportive role for the photoreceptor cells in the retina. Some of them include providing nutrients for the photoreceptor cells, absorbing UV light to protect the photoreceptor cells, recycling photopigment that's part of the visual phototransduction cascade, as well as being responsible for uh, phagocytosing the photoreceptor outer segments as well. Now in the amphibian retina, in newts as well as frogs, it's quite amazing what happens. When you perform a retinectomy, that's when you physically scoop out the retina, you give the animal 30 days to recover, okay? It'll reestablish the retina almost as, no, as if no intervention took place. It's quite remarkable. Now, what does this process entail? It's something known as RP transdifferentiation. It's a two-step process. Once the RP cells notice that the retina has been damaged, it starts to undergo dedifferentiation. It becomes an earlier retinal progenitor cell type. And then it starts to proliferate. And then the second step is to redifferentiate into all the different cell types within the retina. Now, as I stated, earlier in, it's, uh, in fish, it's thought to be the molar glial cells that are uh, the putative stem cells after retinal damage. Now, I wanted to look in the literature and find out how exactly did they determine this. It was a genius experiment that Pamela Raymond's group from the University of Michigan performed. What they did was they de developed the transgenic line of zebrafish where they had the GFAP promoter, that's a molar glial cell specific promoter driving green fluorescent protein. Thus, all, this, all the molar glial cells were lit, up with, were lit up green, essentially. Now, after they damaged the retina, specifically ablating the cone and rod photoreceptors, they found out that there was co-localization between GFP, as well as a marker for rod photoreceptors, as well as GFE, GFP, as well as a, uh, a marker for cone photoreceptors, thus suggesting that these cells have actually come from the molar glial cells. How about in mammals? Well, we know in mice, after damage to the retina, there's a very limited um, response of proliferation of the molar glial cells, but they don't actually dedifferentiate into a retinal progenitor cells. However, dedifferentiation can take place or can be induced by misexpression of retinal stem cell specific genes. However, after dedifferentiation, the redifferentiation phase is somewhat limited in terms of its profile. It can only become certain cell types, such as amacrine cells, as well as bipolar cells. However, what's noted is, you know, the evidence is somewhat equivocal because lineage tracing studies, as has been done in fish, have not been done in the mammal, or in the mice specifically. Now in humans, as I stated, to date, there are no identified retinal stem cells in humans. So the field has really come up with two translational approaches, all right, uh, using stem cell, stem cell transplantation in order to help treat the retina. And that comes in two approaches. One is cell replacement, where you use stem cells to actively replace the lost retinal photoreceptors or other cell types that you're interested in. And the other one is cell protection, where the stem cells provide a trophic factor for the remaining retina. There's a seminal paper published by McLaren and colleagues back in um, the University College of London. And what they noticed was that what they did was they had a retinitis pigmentosa model uh, in mice, and they transplanted rod progenitor cells into the subretinal space of these mice. 
they found out that these progenitor cells were able to differentiate into mature rod foot receptors structurally as well as functionally integrate into the retina as well. And I should also mention that using the cell replacement uh, technique, right now there are phase one and two trials of taking human embryonic stem cell derived RP cells, transplanting it into the subretinal space of patients with geographic atrophy. And so it's quite amazing, yeah. Now there's this new cohort of stem cells known as human-derived neural stem cells, all right? And it's obtained from uh, fetuses from the second trimester. There's this two seminal papers published by a group in K at KCI Institute where they took the RCS rat. That's a specific retinal degeneration model in rat. The primary defect in these rats is that they, ha they lack the ability to phagocytose the photoreceptor outer segments. And thus this leads to toxic debris and the eventual death of the photoreceptor cells. And when they take this, this new, this uh, human-derived neural stem cells and transplant it into the subretinal space of these, uh, these rats, they find out that not only do they preserve photoreceptor viability, also synaptic connections with the second-order neurons, and lastly, also functional vision as well, based on a behavioral assay that's visually mediated. And they found out, actually, that the mechanism that's responsible for this preservation of the photoreceptors and the rest of the retina is twofold. One is it actually acts or adopts the RP's ability to phagocytose the shed outer segments from the photoreceptors, and it also provides trophic factors for the rest of the retina. Now, we know in geographic atrophy in patients with dry ARMD that part of the primary pathology involves the loss of the, RP, loss of the RPE cells and therefore it can't provide those supportive function uh, or roles for the photoreceptor cells, thus leading to further photoreceptor death. There's a particular group, uh, Stem Cell Incorporated, they performed or organized a multi-center phase one study uh, to determine the safety profile of transplanting these human-derived neural stem cells into patients with geographic atrophy. And they found out that there was no adverse side effects with uh, transplantation of these cells in eight patients, or 15 patients. So the question they asked us, they asked a number of centers across the country to be part of their phase two trial, specifically asking, can subretinal transplantation of these human-derived CNS cells um, decrease the rate of geographic atrophy in patients afflicted with, this, uh, with geographic atrophy? Methods, um, eight macular degeneration patients with geographic atrophy in both eyes. They were gonna choose the worst, the eye with the worst best corrected visual acuity to transplant uh, these human-derived CNS cells into the subretinal space. Have them follow up on days zero, one, seven, 28, and months three, six, nine, 12 after transplantation, where they would receive a complete eye examination as well as retinal imaging, including fundus autofluorescence, OCT, as well as photography. Their primary outcome measures include <coughs> determining the rate of progression of geographic atrophy in these patients, as well as secondarily, um, determining their best corrective visual acuity, low luminance visual acuity, as well as contrast sensitivity. Now I should stop here and just tell you that this project has been put on hold right now because the company is actually um, focusing their efforts on using these stem cells for spinal cord as well as brain trauma injury patients. Okay, so this, this project has not started yet. At this point in my talk, I just want to take everybody and bring them to look at the big picture, okay? When I was thinking, I'm going through my literature search as well as, you know, looking into this, uh, this project, I said it's amazing that people are looking or labs are looking into ways to activate, you know, possible intrinsic regenerative mechanisms inside the eye or even use a stem cell transplantation, transplantation technique in order to um, treat the, uh, the eye with a, with a certain retinal disease as well. But I thought to myself, what is the problem? What is the big problem? You know, what's a limitation using these two approaches? And that's something I identified as retinal remodeling, okay? So retinal remodeling was first described by our um, very own Dr. Robert E. Mark here at the University of Utah. What they found out was regardless of the type of retinal degeneration model, after the, the, after the photoreceptors die, 
The rest of the retina goes through a global, massive rewiring of the retina. So the question that I came up with was even if you replace the, the lost photoreceptor or any other cell type that you're interested in, how do you know the rest of the retina is still intact to be able to process vision the same way that you and I do? So if I personally were to come up with a translational approach to help treat blinding diseases affecting the retina, I take a two-step approach. First thing I would do is focus my efforts on really elucidating the mechanisms that govern the pathoetiology or the mechanism that drives that specific disease. Because only once we halt that progression should we focus our efforts on regeneration or using stem cell transplantation to help replace some of those lost cells with the hopes of one day allowing somebody with an affected ret retinal disease to be able to see this image in its entirety. On that note, I'd like to thank Dr. Bernstein for giving me the opportunity to, to uh, present this topic. And thank you. Last but not least, our QI project that Dr. Jorgensen and I are actually working on um, is trying to develop an electronic sign-out program for our neuro-ophthalmology patients at the VA because there's such a high turnover of residents there. So it's very important that you know, the patients don't fall through the cracks and that we uh, follow up appropriately uh, on their studies. So on that note, thank you very much. Questions? Dr. Bernstein. Can you talk a little bit about the role of immunosuppression in these trials? That's definitely true. Okay, that's a very good question, yes. You know, as part of this phase two trial, they want to use tacrolimus. Yeah, uh, I believe it was starting at seven days prior to transplantation. Uh, they have never shown that there's any side effects, right, from in terms of uh, inflammation inside of the eye after transplantation. But just in case they've been, they want to use immunosuppression. Yeah, and it also includes, I believe, corticosteroids uh, on the day of the surgery as well. And then just one other comment. You know, obviously there's a lot of interest from patients about <coughs> stem cells and what they can do. The problem, of course, is dealing with the hype and the misinformation that's out there. Mm -hmm. And that comes not only from the internet and things out there, but even the researchers. There's a lot of things, because this is market-driven, as you can tell, you know, this study was done by Stem Cells Inc., and then they make a business decision and withdraw the study because they're going to go do something else. But there's incentive to publish very quickly and to, to go beyond you know, what's just proof of principle and safety, which is what a phase one study is. But it gets hyped up. You know, if you take the worst eye of someone, it's, a, it's likely it's going to get a little bit better, regress to the mean, and, you, and they'll make a big deal about that. And it's, this, this field is still really in its infancy, and there's a lot of you know, people going off to China and Cuba and other places that will take your money a lot of money and inject some stem cells. Actually, even Florida will do this now because you can inject abdominal stem cells directly into a person's eye and the FDA cannot stop you or cannot stop the doctor if it's all done in the same day in the same person's cells. So there's a regulatory problems and it's really yeah. an issue. So it's, it's the wild west out there and you have to tell, you have to tell the patients that's what it is and you got and I would certainly never recommend doing anything except under an FDA-approved trial in the United States because it's going to be a problem otherwise. It's not even limited to retina. One of our old colleagues is now regenerating crystalline lenses in China. And so um, I had a patient yesterday ask me why I, she should have an implant after cataract surgery, why we can't regenerate his lens. Because he looked it up online, and there's a lot of hype now online from one of our old colleagues about regenerating lenses. It's, well, we do it every day in the rabbits, but that doesn't mean it's controlled and something we can do. And so, you know, patients are online all the time looking this, looking, in, looking this up. Dr. Vitali. And the, you know, the injection of intraventral stem cells into the eye has had disastrous uh, vision uh, effects in patients. I think part of the problem is uh, Dr. Bernstein, as he alluded to, we're just scratching the surface in terms of understanding really even the ontology as well as the epigenetics that control stem cell development. So um, if you ask me personally, I feel like this is a very crude form of engineering. We're just shoving cells into a certain area and 
praying to God or whoever, you know, that something happens essentially. So, yeah. Jim? So, to my knowledge, there were two major companies in the U.S. that were doing this. One was Stem Cells Inc., like Dr. Bernstein said, that we were going to be a study site for before they diverted their funds toward spinal cell projects. Is the other company still focusing on retina issues, or is it out of the question? They're actually currently undergoing phase one and two. I forgot the name of the, the company, but they're it's using ACT, human. ACT. Yeah. It's ACT. Okay. <laughs> I think they're actually using human embryonic derived stem uh, uh, RPE cells. Yeah. And then we, we just to comment on Dr. Bernstein's comment, we've seen these patients who I had one a few months ago. Last note was from a year ago. They were, I don't know, 2060 had dry AMD and they disappeared. And then he came back and he had a total RD with horrible PBR. He got in the Mexico City and so implantation. Uh, the result was not pretty. So they, when they ask, they usually will find a way unless we say don't do it. All right, thank you very much, guys.